My name is Cédric Junion. I'm head of the international office for the school. And so the goal of our office is to give our students and our staff opportunities to get the right tools for their future. So in this connected world we live in, of course, you need language skills, you need personal skills, you need interdisciplinary skills. And our class, International Innovation Management, taught by Professor Palota here, is one of our showcase classes, I'd say. So it's the only class um, in the school which makes 50% of engineers and 50% of economists. So we're really happy, happy with this concept, which prepares you to real life, where engineers and economists work together. Um, and it's a very rare program because in the end, as you well know, there is this trip to San Francisco, uh, which of course you all look forward to. So we're very happy to have the state sponsorship to help us with this. And uh, even if it's a complicated year, we're very optimistic that it will take place in good circumstances. And our team is doing the best to prepare a very good program on site. And Swiss Next San Francisco, who are our host today, will of course help us a lot in this way. Um, we're very lucky tonight that they have prepared for us a great panel of speakers. So here you can see in Swiss Next, you can see Julia and Yannick, who are our hosts. So hey there. And they prepared for you today uh, a really fantastic panel of speakers. People will share some experiences, trying to give you some insight into the entrepreneurial mindset that we'd like to transmit to you, something which is really strong in the US, especially in the Silicon Valley, and which is sometimes a bit lacking in Switzerland. So be entrepreneurial tonight already. Don't be shy. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, you can ask them on the chat. And at the end of the sessions, we'll ask the speakers the questions on the chat. Or feel free to ask them yourself. It's sometimes it's always more spontaneous, and it makes it maybe easier. So the mic will be here. And we'll activate it when we have a question at the end of the speaker's session. So um, with this, I think I said pretty much everything. Thanks for keeping your camera on and not multitasking. Be attention, pay attention to our speakers. We're very lucky to have them tonight. And if that's okay, I will leave the floor to San Francisco. Right, didn't I forget anything? Also fine. All right, we're on. Thank you very much for your introduction, Cédric, and a warm welcome from beautiful San Francisco. Um, I am Julia. I'm Partnerships Associate here at Swissnex in San Francisco, and I'm sitting here with Yannick, our Deputy CEO. And we're actually sitting here in the most beautiful room of our office space here at Pier 17, with a view directly onto the Bay Bridge, which is wonderful. Um, we also have our colleague Natalia here in the room. You don't see her, but she's our operations manager, meaning she's also taking care of all things IT today, and she will react if we run into any issues. Yeah, today's lecture is going to be about you being introduced into the mindset of the San Francisco Bay Area slash Silicon Valley. And you will hear from four high profile speakers about what it means to innovate in the Bay Area. Um, and it will give you an, an idea about what to expect also, also if you were to come to the US market at some point in the future professionally as well. This lecture is really at the core of what we do here at Swiss Next in San Francisco. Um, we as an organization make it our mission to empower next generation innovators by providing them with the mindset, but also the skill set and network they need to make our planet and societies thrive. So we are really excited for this session today. And without much further ado, let me just quickly run you through today's agenda. Um, Yannick will share our agenda from today. So in a few minutes, you will hear an inspirational story from Joya Deuchert, our CEO here at Swiss Next in San Francisco. And she will also give you some more insights into who we are as an organization. Then we will be joined by Vincent Borel from Logitech, um, who is going to give you in-depth insights into the San Francisco Bay Area ecosystem and the mindset as compared to the Swiss mindset. And you'll have the opportunity also to ask any questions if you have any. 
Then we'll have a 15 minute break. And after the break, we will be joined by Celine and Sven. They will tell you their stories on the mindset shift that was required when they brought their individual startups to San Francisco or to the Bay Area from Switzerland. And we're also have, going to have a super insightful discussion with them, um, with Selim and Sven, and really learn from their experiences. I am super excited about this session, and it will also help you to prepare for your trip to San Francisco, which, as Cedric said, is very likely going to come up next year in February. So keep that in mind a little bit as well. Okay, so for today's session, let me quickly establish a few house rules. Cedric already mentioned a few of them already. Um, since you're all sitting, or most of you are sitting in the same room today, we ask you to avoid um, disturbing noise, meaning keep your microphones off and your audio off. Um, we do, however, ask you to keep your cameras turned on um, because this is still a session that requires your physical presence. Um, and it is also a lot more pleasant for us and our speakers to speak to your wonderful faces much rather than just a gray screen. So please turn your cameras on. Um, you do still have the opportunity always to ask questions as well. If you do have any questions, just type them into the chat. Um, Yannick here will also help me to keep track of the chat. So he will bring your questions to my awareness um, along the way. Yeah, I highly encourage you to be curious during this entire session and really think of questions as you hear the stories from our speakers. I ask you to be engaging in that way for two reasons. Uh, for one, this combination of people that you will get to hear from today is very rare and very valuable. So really try and make that most out of it for yourself by making sure your questions are being answered and also to kind of make sure that these speakers remember you because you never know whether they might become relevant for you in the future again. And then also number two being, it is simply not very pleasant for our speakers to deliver their stories with passion and care and to then not receive a response from their audience. So please be as engaging as possible for yourself and also for our speakers. And then lastly, you may have noticed that our session is being recorded. Um, we're recording it on our end and we're going to make the recording accessible on our YouTube channel and our social media channels. If this is an issue for any one of you, please let us know in the chat or after the session and we'll be, we'll be making sure to edit out your personal information from the recording. Okay, and then also to make it best for yourself, turn on the speaker view instead of the gallery view. That way you will also get to see the most thing going on during the session as well. All right, I've talked enough um, about what we're expecting from you all. Now I would love to hear a bit more about what you're expecting from today's session. Um, we created a word cloud on Menti. Natalia is going to send the link into the chat right now. Um, so please make sure to click on that link and let us know what you're expecting from today's session. Um, it will allow you to roughly type in one or two words um, per entry that you're doing. You can write something like I'm expecting fun or interesting conversations, whatever it may be. Um, so please type it in there and we'll see in a little bit life what's happening there and what you're expecting. I hope you can all click the link. Wonderful, we have the first answers coming in. Information and discovery, absolutely. You will discover a lot about the San Francisco Bay Area ecosystem. Yes, you will learn <laughs> a lot. Inspiration, wonderful, love to see that. Great, yeah, discovery. I think this is a major one. Thank you so much. Fun, yeah, I hope you'll have fun. <laughs> also, Vincenzo and Cedric, always feel free to participate in these things as well. We also love to hear your expectations. It's all anonymous, so no right or wrong here, neither. New insights, absolutely. I hope you get to um, hear a lot of things and information that you haven't known yet. Great. It's always fun to see. Silicon Valley, yep. Yeah, I think the, the most important ones here in the center and the biggest ones, information, learn about innovation. Absolutely. I think these are at the core of today's session, which is perfect. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Natalia, for sharing the screen. 
Good. Well, by now we also have our first speaker from today. We have Joya Deutsch here with us, our CEO here at Swiss Next in San Francisco, and she's sitting right next to me. And Natalia is going to swing over to her. Um, Joya, <laughs> Joya has been with Swiss Next for over 12 years now. And we're excited to hear a little bit more about Swiss Next from you and are looking forward to hearing your San Francisco Bay Area innovation story as well. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Julia, Yannick, Vincenzo. It's a pleasure to work with you and your team again. And this time, I welcome you to the Silicon Valley or to San Francisco virtually for the time being. We can't wait for you guys to all come here and experience in the flesh what this uh, region has to offer and what it feels like. Um, and it's, uh, I thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about sort of my story and take it or leave it, take from it whatever feels resonates uh, with you. Um, maybe to start off, I, I, I went to school in Geneva and in, in Boston in the United States. Um, I think in that um, experience, I already saw a few differences between how things work in Switzerland and also how the educational system works in the United States. I saw the good, the bad and the ugly of both systems, I would say. but. Um, already, I would say, stretched a little bit my understanding of um, what science and education can do to uh, generate a next uh, generation of innovators. Um, during my time in Boston, but also already before when I was younger, I had come to visit San Francisco a few times and was always really enthralled by just the beauty, the physical beauty of this uh, region of the, you know, this, this city that is so quaint and so colorful, so dense, very reminiscent of Europe in many ways, yet it's on the water and it feels so different, it feels so possible. Um, so when I, when I had the opportunity, and I have to say it was love that brought me to San Francisco primarily, but I came here with a job, um, and that was the job at Swissnex, and Swissnex was this, you know, little small um, Swiss organization, very little about, um, an innovation platform working on behalf of Switzerland, connecting Switzerland with, um, at that point, a few, a handful of the, of, of, of the world's most important innovation hubs. At that point, we had offices in Boston, in San Francisco, in um, China, Shanghai, in Singapore, and uh, had just opened an office in India. And I didn't really know much about what Swissnext was really doing. I had a hard time really grasping it, but it just felt like it was a place that allowed me to meet many of my passions, which were so diverse and so disconnected that I always felt like I don't really know what my home is. You know, I, I'm interested in so many different things. And how, how will I ever find something that sort of meets that breadth of, um, breadth of, of interests? And Swissnext became this place where I realized, oh, wait, you know, this is really about science, innovation, education in the broad sense of the term. And um, it allowed me to really explore. And Swissnext today is actually a, a network with two additional offices around the world. So I had the opportunity to do a few years later after living here in San Francisco, go to Brazil, open our office in Rio de Janeiro and um, Sao Paulo. And, um, and then came back a few years later, 2017, here to San Francisco as, as the CEO. And most recently, we actually opened an office in Japan as well. So this beautiful little network has grown. And it is uh, really Switzerland's foremost innovation platform that supports the Swiss innovation ecosystem broadly from universities to research labs, startups to corporates to make connections and ensure that there is a transfer of insights, but also of people and talents and ideas between those hubs and Switzerland. And here in San Francisco, um, as Julia mentioned, we are very much focused on empowering the next generation of innovators to become change makers to create a planet and a society that can thrive and are healthy and sustainable for all of us and the generations after us to continue living. And for that, of course, science and innovation are absolutely crucial. So back to my story, when I came here to San Francisco, I quickly absorbed the entrepreneurial spirit. You know, anybody you've talked to here well, is working on some kind of a startup. It's working on some kind of a project. If it's not a startup, it's a project. It's something they do on the side that they're trying to get off the ground. And it's extremely inspiring to be in an environment where that is the, is the default. That is the default mode. Saying you just have a job is, is, is not enough. You, you need to be working on something else on the side that eventually is going to give you an alternative um, project in your life. 
And in that spirit, I realized, you know, for, for any Swiss science or technology-based entrepreneur, it is extremely important to spend some time here. Simply because of that sense of possibility, of the sense of opportunity that you experience when you come here. Really, the sky's the limit. It's very much a, you know, a, an overused sentence, but it is how people feel. They feel like they have agency to really make change and to really create something from nothing. And that has a lot to do, of course, with the history of this region, which has over the centuries attracted the pioneers, the true adventurers, the gold diggers that came here as sort of the last part of the United States of the main line, right before the connecting to Asia, and we're trying to make it over here. And that is a spirit you still find. And today we have actually about 30% of the population here are immigrants. If you look at the founder culture, it's over 60% of founders in the Bay Area are immigrants. So it's a very interesting environment because it attracts people from around the world who have an interest in somehow going beyond, growing beyond themselves and building something here. So together with colleagues, we built the first startup program for Swiss startups over here, um, where we are bringing um, Swiss entrepreneurs, early stage entrepreneurs to the Bay Area to absorb some of that thinking, to absorb some of that spirit, but also very concretely learn some of the, you know, the tricks of the trade on how to build a startup successfully. Because as you for sure know very well, this is probably the most thriving entrepreneurial hub worldwide to this day, where startup creation, capital, venture capital, and science all go hand in hand. It's an extremely interesting and dense environment. So before I end, I want to leave you with a few of my key insights from what I have learned living in the Bay Area for about, you know, combined nine years now. I think one is that success, success requires a learning mindset that is built on exploration and experimentation. And I love to see this world cloud because I think you all get that. Life is about exploration. Life is about just going beyond what you know and seeing what's there and seeing what you can move and then try it. It's not enough to just think about it. You gotta just do it. You just gotta give it a try. And I think that is absolutely key. And you have so much to learn on that journey. Second is that there is great reward in failing. When you fail, you discover the limitations, the boundaries of what you're working on, but also of yourself. And there is incredible wealth in recognizing that and understanding where you need to grow, where you can grow, but also where you need others in order to make something happen. And someone once told me that, you know, succeeding at life, you succeed at life by a million deaths. It's somehow every time you have a small failure, you can come out of that stronger, but it's important that you spend the moment to think about, you know, what went wrong right now? And what does this, what can I take away from this experience? And how can I do it differently next time? And I think again, that's the spirit and I'm sure you'll hear much more about that in the rest of the sessions. That is very much um, deeply ingrained in the culture here. And then the third takeaway for me is that I, I at some point I realized, you know, I'm, I should look at myself a little bit, my life as my own startup. So I call it the startup of me. I, I love thinking of it that way because it is a project that requires both ambition and vision but also agility, flexibility, adaptation, the ability to pivot when something goes wrong. And again, exploration, which is key, which is key for us to actually see the things that are beyond our current reach. And it takes a strong team of believers and supporters. Nobody can do it by themselves. So this takes me back to the slogan of SwiftNet, which is all about mindset, skill sets, networks. If you think of the startup of you or the startup of, you know, me, of you, it really takes a mindset, one that expands, one that grows, one that wants to go beyond and discover, one that embraces what is, but can dream beyond what is. It takes a skill set that, of course, requires hard skills, 
lifelong learning, continuous improvement education, right? But more importantly, soft skills. It's really the soft skills that are going to take us to the next level. And it's something that you need to con continuously nurture in your life as you grow in your careers, as you, you know, work with different teams or start leading teams. And then ultimately networks. It's the colleagues, it's the friends, and it's the family that will actually support you in your journey and make that possible. Not only because they believe in you and they support you, but also it's the other people that actually connect you with the opportunities you need, that support you on your journey, that collaborate with you. And none of us can do it ourselves. And it's the networks that ultimately help turn us into the best version of ourselves to be successful. This is it for me. So I wish you a really amazing day today and I cannot wait to see you all here. And I'm excited to um, be still part of the, well, here at Belson next, but also <laughs> if, if, if I can be part of the, of the Q&A. Yes, thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much, Joya, for your inspirational words and for your valuable information as well. I think one of my key takeaways of what you just mentioned is really that we're here in the San Francisco Bay Area and such a melting pot of people from a variety of cultures that all have this need this hunger to, to create something themselves, right? And that we can really make use of that by having such a learning attitude and wanting to be curious. And that is something that we should all really try and do and implement. So thank you so much for these insights. Um, we do have a few more minutes um, with Joya before she has to jump off. Is there any question from the audience? If you have a question for Joya about Swiss Next, about her experience, a quick one, type it into the chat. Um, and we can see that. Otherwise, I have a short question for her, but I would like to open up the opportunity. Hey, hi, Joya. David I would like to thank you once again for your support, for also for the previous edition of, uh, of the trip. I, uh, I mean, uh, um, I recognize that this next play uh, I, uh, a very important role in the success of this uh, program. And I really uh, want to thank you for uh, for all that you have, that you have done for us and you're going to do in the future <laughs> and i really hope that we can resume the the trip this this year we're really look, looking forward for that thank you so much thank you Vincenzo. great thank you um if there is no question from the audience let me ask you a quick question joya if you came to the us again to start your career to to do what you did now what would you do differently if you did it again mm -hmm. it's a hard question <laughs> um quite honestly I, I would probably try to be myself involved in a startup um and actually work in one just to because I think we, we have learned a lot by affiliation. We have learned a lot by, you know, working with the startups that come through here. And of course, that's incredibly rich because we see so many different paths and so many different, um, you know, companies that do it differently and have different ways of, of, of also tackling issues. But I think I would want to be myself in, engaged and really taking something off the ground and building it up. I had the opportunity to do that in Brazil, but you know, as a governmental startup, not quite the same. Um, but um, yeah, I think that I would do differently probably. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, I see we have one question from you. You mentioned soft skills. While I would assume the necessary, these remain the same in the US, would you say you see them with a different approach in the American culture? Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting question. And you know, I think in part, I, I, I wonder if, the, if there is an American culture. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, can, I can speak to the Bay Area culture, which is, which is a very, very unique culture, I would say, even within America. Um, how are they different? I would say, I guess that would go under soft skill, but I think you mentioned the word, which is a key word, which is curiosity. Curiosity is more than intellectual curiosity. Curiosity is really an attitude in life. And it's a way in which you engage, not just with people, with situations. 
And I think that's something that I have felt like in, I'm sometimes missing a little bit in Switzerland. I think we're very quick to judge something as good or bad, whether that's an experience or a circumstance or a choice someone makes. And I think a little bit more of a mindset of, uh, how do I say that, not um, interrogation in, in a situation like that, where you approach any given situation with a curiosity, I think is really helpful in life. And I feel like that's something I've experienced a lot here, right? Instead of when you talk about whatever random idea you have and you got shut down because people are like, that's crazy. Like, why would you do that? That's never going to work. That, that, that's what I mean with quick, quick in judgment, right? People are just quick to judge in Switzerland. People are very quick to put things in a, in a cupboard or in a, in a category, you know, works or doesn't work. Um, and so, so, um, so I think the, that's, this idea that you really dare to take uh, risks um, is, and, and, and you, you approach that with a curiosity mindset as well, I think it's, 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 it's huge. And that's something I feel like I learned a lot. So even that idea of risk, the risk-taking side, you think of that with a curiosity mindset. Absolutely. I think that goes a little bit also into the question that David asked, which one is the soft skill that are the most relevant, important to succeed out here? It's, yes, I think that, and I think another one is, is openness, and I think they probably go very closely together. Um, I think uh, this is going a little bit back to, to startups, right? Something we see often for startups coming from Switzerland is that they're very afraid to talk about what they're working on, because they're afraid someone might steal their idea, steal, you know, the genius of what they're working on. And here there's very much the mindset that, you know, the success is in the execution, it's not in the idea. Ideas are cheap. Um, and in order to be successful in the execution, you have to talk to as many people as you can in order to A, get feedback on what you're working on, to tap into the collective intelligence that is such a wealth of resource out there. I mean, I can't figure it out by myself sitting in my laboratory and do the best work I can. It's not going to be enough. There is incredible wealth in the brains and experiences and viewpoints and perspectives and expertise of the people around me. And for that, you need to talk about what you're what working on. You need to talk about your idea. You need to bounce them back. You need to get the feedback. You need to be open to hearing that feedback. And it's not always gonna be what you wanna hear, but I think that is, is super crucial uh, in terms of, of, of mindset for the Bay Area as well. Well, thank you so much, Joya. I, I know you have to run off. Thank you so much for joining. Thank um, you for asking your questions as well. Um, thank you, Marilyn, also for, for your comment that you just sent. Um, yeah, we're going to, to continue. <laughs> thank you, Ju. Um, bye, 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 Joya. Thank you so much. <laughs> bye. All right. Uh, before we proceed with Vincent from Logitech, I have one quick question for you. We have a poll ready. One thing I would like to, to hear from you is who of you has even been to the US before? Um, just curious to, to see where you're all at. Who has been out here? It's anonymous. Um, feel free to share. Great, okay, so the majority of you has been out here. This is great to see, great to hear that some of you already have ties to the US. Let me ask you one more question then. When you hear the words Silicon Valley or San Francisco Bay Area, you can type that in the chat. Um, what is the first word you hear, uh, you think of when you hear Silicon Valley or San Francisco Bay Area? What comes to mind? Facebook, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No longer called Facebook now. Innovation, Apple, innovation, yeah. innovation. Facebook, Apple, great. Mm -hmm. So some of our unicorns <laughs> out here. Exactly. Cold. Facebook is meta now. Thank you, Natalia. Cold. Good one. Yes, even in summer, it is cold in the San Francisco Bay Area. Correct. It's windy. All right. What about culture? What, what comes to your mind? Culture out here. Not much. <laughs> Money, <laughs> large investments, yeah. very diverse. Yes, as Joya said, there's really a melting pot of different cultures out here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Absolutely, FinTech, absolutely. Yes, great. 
yeah, thank you so much for participating, for letting us know. This is also interesting for us and for Vincent as well to, to hear how many of you have somewhat gotten an experience out here, somewhat an idea of what it's like and has an impression. Wonderful, okay, thank you. Now I would like to proceed and move on to our first external speaker who, have, who I have announced. It's Vincent Borel from Logitech. Hi, Vincent. Hello, hello everyone. Hi. How's everyone hello. doing? <laughs> we are doing good. Um, Vincent is an executive and entrepreneur at Logitech, where he leads the Logitech's Creator Business Group, which includes streaming cameras, microphones, and Streamlabs streaming services. And Vincent is also from Vaux, meaning he'll really be able to give you insights into um, what it's like to come from Switzerland to the San Francisco Bay Area um, and what the mindset shift is like there. So to the class, please, again, have your questions ready. Maybe already start typing them into the chat as Vincent is speaking. Um, and Vincent, I'm happy to let you take over in the next few minutes. All right, great. So let me share my screen. And so for this session, um, I'm going to try and make sure I can see the chat because uh, I do want to ask all of you some questions and the easiest will be for you to answer in the chat. So we'll do a bit of a quiz. But before we get to this quiz, um, let me just kind of tell you a little bit about myself, uh, my story. Uh, how did I end up in Silicon Valley? What did I learn uh, through my time in Silicon Valley? So I spent now probably more than half of my life outside of Switzerland. Um, so I'm neither um, Swiss nor American nor uh, anything, actually. Uh, as, a, as a traveler, you learn that you're actually a foreigner wherever you are. Uh, in Silicon Valley, I'm a Swiss. In Switzerland, uh, I'm an American. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, embrace, I guess, that, um, uh, that part. Uh, when I first uh, came to Silicon Valley, actually, was uh, for high school. And uh, when I left Switzerland, uh, it was in the early 90s. And, um, you know, I, I hated school. I always hated school. Uh, and um, when I got uh, in the U.S., something changed for me. Uh, and, and that thing was, uh, a mindset shift. Uh, what, what really happened was, um, the approach of, uh, education and, uh, coming from Switzerland, uh, you know, there was a certain way of, of teaching and, you know, it was either correct or it was incorrect. Uh, and, uh, you always had to, you know, go for the grades and, and, and there was, um, just this um, lack of encouragement that existed. Uh, but when I came to the US, the first thing that I noticed was, you know, it didn't matter if you failed the first time when you did something, there was always the encouragement of what is the learning? What did you learn in the process? What did you take away? And so maybe the first test you did wasn't great, but uh, you spent a lot of time talking about what did you, you know, making sure that you learn from your mistake. And, um, and that was my first encounter. Uh, but obviously, I was a student. I was not exposed to business or any of those parts. Then I left Silicon Valley. I came back for my first job uh, because I really liked it. I also happened to be working in tech. And if you work in tech, you know, uh, Silicon Valley was, was the place um, to be. I arrived in Silicon Valley on September 7th, 2001. That was four days before September 11th. Um, had I moved my flight by four days, I probably would have never made it to the US for a long time. Uh, and my life would have looked quite different. Um, and so from that moment on, I've always had uh, a hate and love for Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is a really unique place. Uh, it's quite intense. Yes, it's in California. Yes, it's by the Pacific. People do go surfing. Uh, people do walk around in flip-flops and, and everything seems pretty cool. But the reality is it's a very intense place. It's a place where people come with a mission, with a vision, uh, with a desire to make something. Uh, and uh, that's been true before tech. Uh, you know, many people came to San Francisco, as Joya said, for the gold rush. 
Uh, and then the gold rush became the silicon rush. Uh, and then it became the internet rush. Uh, but there's always been kind of this desire that people come here uh, for whatever reason, they believe that they need to come to Silicon Valley to make what they want to make. And this, the reason is, the real reason is, it's not that the place itself, the, the environment, uh, the physical uh, environment is different. It's a mindset shift. And so uh, I'm going to talk to you about this mindset shift today, and I'm going to do it through uh, a few questions first. Uh, and so get ready to uh, answer uh, in the chat room, and then I'll explain uh, why I'm asking you those questions. So the first one, staying close to Switzerland and to snow. Um, how many of you know about Snow Devil? Anyone? Probably most of you don't, but actually Snow Devil is a startup that became a big company that's really well known today. The only difference is Snow Devil is no longer called Snow Devil. It's called Shopify. All right. Now, how many of you know of Odeo? Any of you know? Someone knows. Do you want to say what Odeo is? Actually, audio is very famous. It's just under a different name and it kind of does a different thing. So Odeo was a podcasting platform before podcast even became a thing. Uh, and it actually became one of the largest social networks in the world called Twitter. All right. I have another one for you. Anyone know Glitch? Glitch doesn't exist anymore. Oh, Yannick says, said yes. All right, Yannick, do you want to answer the question? <laughs> I have no clue who they can. <laughs> All right. Well, You'll be happy to know that if you had invested in Glitch, you'd be like many of those other companies, you'd be a millionaire, potentially a billionaire. Glitch today is worth more than $4 billion, was recently acquired by Salesforce, and is called Slack. It was a gaming company. They made video games. And in the process of making video games, they they customized IRC, which was a chat channel. And they liked the chat so much that they turned it into a product. Are you getting the riff? Does anyone know TuneIn hookup? No. <laughs> Did it turn into uh, Tinder? <laughs> it could have. It could have. Still no one, huh? All right. Well, I think a lot of you can then you, you'll see because you can when you start digging uh, into this, it's fascinating. Uh, and it's fascinating for one thing, because all of these actually became some of the biggest companies, you know, some of them you probably use on a daily basis. Well, TuneIn was a dating video site and the founders of uh, TuneIn were none others that the found, than the founders of YouTube. So when Chad Hurdy started YouTube with his co-founder, um, it was a video dating site. And then after a few pitch, they realized that, you know, the video part was really a good idea. The dating side was not such a good idea. And it became YouTube and sold for $1.6 billion to Google. I have an easier one for all of you now. Does anyone know bourbon? This should be closer to home. I hope someone knows bourbon. I 
I'm still looking for a yes in the chat room. Ah, someone answered, Marilyn. That's right. Bourbon is Instagram. So what Bourbon was, Bourbon was actually a location check-in service. Uh, and the founder, uh, Kevin Sistrom of Instagram, when he started it, he was actually competing with Foursquare uh, and many of those other location check-in uh, platforms. And, um, you know, they had raised some money, half a million dollars, so they were not doing too bad, but the numbers were not really growing. And so they spent a lot of time analyzing the data. They went back and they said, hey, what's working? What are people using? What are we, what can we get out of this? And they realized that the most used feature from what they had created was picture. People like to share their pictures and comment on them. They stripped down the whole product to be a picture sharing platform. And because Kevin Sistrom had this love of beautiful things, he didn't want people to share just any kind of picture. So he created filters to make sure that the pictures, whatever picture you took and you shared on the platform would look good. And it became a, you know, the, the biggest, uh, probably the biggest success uh, from a um, social network that was acquired later by Facebook uh, for what we thought was a really large number because they paid a billion dollars back then. Uh, and, you know, everyone was like, wait, but Instagram doesn't make any money. Why would you buy it for a billion dollars? And then that actually transformed the Silicon Valley. It transformed how people and VCs valued companies. Um, and Instagram opened the way for Facebook to actually acquire quite a few other companies. Um, it included WhatsApp, for which they paid more than $17 billion, right? Um, and so uh, what you see through the examples that I've taken, and I have a few more for you, but um, is there is no company that starts one way and ends up the same way that it started. And the point is, how did those companies become successful? By failing and learning and iterating and pivoting. And um, that's the biggest mindset you have in Silicon Valley. That's what people learn when they come to Silicon Valley is, you know, you got to be very candid. You got to be okay to get feedback and you shouldn't keep something closed away from other people until it's perfect because nobody cares about perfect. You know, uh, if you've made something too perfect, chances are you won't want to change it. But if you've created something that's just an idea, you know, I just had this idea, I want to share it with you. You're much more open to actually going and changing it, right? And that's not necessarily part of the Swiss culture because we like things to be pretty perfect. Uh, and so it's really hard to change because when you've spent so much effort in making something perfect, you don't want to change it. Another example, do you know why? Um, I, this picture has Netflix envelopes. Anybody know? What are those envelopes? That's right. Netflix actually was a DVD company. They used to ship DVDs. You would pay a monthly fee and you could have up to six DVDs at home and then you'd ship them back and they, and you could, or you could order more. Guess what? Netflix realized that the world was changing. They realized that with YouTube and others, uh, you know, streaming and downloading content was the biggest trend. And if they didn't want to disappear like Blockbuster, which they replaced, you know, the physical DVD store where you would go and rent your movie for the weekend, um, they had to reinvent themselves. So imagine how you transform a company that's gotten really good at shipping DVDs to becoming the biggest streaming service in the world. That takes, you know, quite a bit of candor. You got to be honest with yourself. You got to be able to look at what you've done and still be able to change. And then someone else mentioned another one earlier, and that's an even bigger one. And I, I guess most of you know it, but, you know, think of Meta. Meta is Facebook. Facebook is Meta, right? This is the biggest social network in the world. And even at that scale, they're able to go, hey, you know what? We need to change. We need to reinvent ourselves. They may have 2 billion users. Most, other, most people would say, hey, you know what? You have it all. 
Why even bother, right? Well, guess what? Facebook is also Instagram. It's all of those other, word, other things, but they realized that the trend was shifting. And if they weren't going to pivot, if they weren't going to learn and fail, they would get replaced like so many other companies uh, over time. And that's the biggest change. And so what, what is that? What is that common thing across all of them? It's growth mindset. Uh, this is something I experienced as a student in high school, that notion that, you know, whatever you don't know today, you can know tomorrow and that's okay. You know, but as long as you're ready to go out and, and learn and become better, a better person, a better company, a better boss, a better partner uh, day after day, then, you know, you'll, you'll get better and you'll succeed right now. How you go about uh, doing that is is really important, but the growth mindset is is essentially captured in the following way. It's about seeing failure as an opportunity to grow, as opposed to seeing failure as a limit of your abilities. Right? If you try something and you fail and you go, "I'm just not good at this," and you give up, you've just limited yourself. But think about as a baby, you know, if you're a parent and you have your baby, if your baby stopped walking after the first time trying, guess what? We'd all be crawling today. Right. And so as kids, we naturally do it as adults, we lose it because the fear of actually not succeeding prevents us from moving forward. But in Silicon Valley, that notion is embraced. It's okay to fail. It's actually good to fail. It means you've learned something because if you take the time to look at what you've done and learn from it, you're going to get better. And so there's this philosophy in Silicon Valley of fail fast, fail often, right? And it actually changes the way you operate, changes the way you do, do things. And I talked about making things perfect. Well, guess what? The startups in Silicon Valley, they don't make things perfect. They, they might not even code or create something. They'll first start with an idea, go out in the street, go and talk to potential customers and say, what would you think about this? You didn't even do anything. You didn't even spend more than a minute potentially at the beginning when you're starting just with ideas. And then you spend a bit more time and you're like, hey, what do you think about this? I just drew it. And then you, know, you evolve your idea. As you get feedback, you get better. And so this notion of, you know, I really like this one, this notion of, of uh, an archer. You know, you could try and become the best archer in the world, but you only have one arrow and you're going to, you know, practice all you can until you're going to try and aim that arrow in the bullseye. Or you could just get a hundred arrows and just keep shooting and learning every time until you put a bullseye. Guess what? You're more likely to put it in the bullseye if you go with a hundred arrows and do it quickly and iterate and learn every time than trying to get one perfect arrow in the bullseye. All right, I will turn it over to questions. Thank you so much, Vincent. Super interesting. A lot of it I had no idea about. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, please ask Vincent questions. We have 10 minutes until the break, so feel free to ask. There is one question in the chat already, Vincent. I don't know if you want to, to read Yeah, it. I'm reading it. So what's the best, according to you, having a growth mindset through devotion for years in one project and startup or have multiple average projects and startup? Ooh, look, I, I think that, you know, I'm a firm believer that whatever you do, you should do it to the full of its possibility, right? And uh, it doesn't mean that it needs to be perfect from the start. But anyone that actually pushes the boundary is going to iterate with that obsession of wanting it to get it to be the best, right? And so the mentality that you see in Silicon Valley, the mentality that you see in people that succeed is this resilience. You know, you got to be resilient going after what you're really passionate about, but also being very candid in taking the learnings and not being obsessed to go after something just because you want to, you got to take the learnings. You got to be open to hearing the feedback, understanding, reading, uh, uh, you know, the data that's coming back to iterate. So my recommendation is, you know, always follow your passion. And if you follow your passion, you know, the motivation comes naturally, but then 
it's all of the other things, you know, it's about being open-minded and about being ready to learn, but go all the way. Don't go halfway. Great. There is a second question. By what was the first project you worked on when you arrived in the U S and how did it go? Um, good, good question. So when I first, um, uh, first joined for my first, um, I guess my first job, I worked for Dolby, Dolby labs, you know, Dolby stereo, Dolby digital. Um, and that was my first passion. I actually loved the audio. I still love audio. Um, I tried to play instruments. I was terrible at it. Uh, but I really wanted to contribute to music. Uh, and to me, you know, I was better with math than I was, uh, as an artist. And so, uh, that's why I decided to join, uh, to do my studies and then join Dolby to be able to contribute to the, to the, um, yeah, to the music industry and so on. And so my first project was actually building uh, a 3D audio uh, processor that was used for um, um, in theaters for playing movies. So the first surround movies uh, in, um, in, uh, in theaters. Ah, Vincenzo has a question. Hi, Vincent. We share the same name, so which means uh, we, the winner. So we are the winners. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So thank you so much for uh, your insights. Your uh, really, uh, I keep try. I keep saying this all the time. It's it's very hard uh, in uh, in Switzerland to uh, to can get rid of this uh, mindset where we have to do things for, right from the beginning and uh, which our students are kind of get used to since the, the primary school. So, okay, well, but well, actually I have a, a, a different question. Do you think that there is a way uh, to come on, to somehow to uh, unleash this uh, mindset and uh, what, what do you think about the fact that uh, uh, Americans always uh, throw parties and have a lot of fun and uh, so they kind of uh, uh, less uh, um, constrained by you know inhib inhibitions and then can share what they think more freely and we're and instead here in Europe and Switzerland we're always uh, consider ourselves too seriously and um, don't allow ourselves to, 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 to have fun while working what do you think about that? I think it's really important, you know, and, and I started off by saying, you know, I hated school until I moved to the U S and the reality was, and I saw it more recently after having kids, uh, who were born in Switzerland, but started school in the U S. Um, it's, it's really important. You know, life doesn't need to be boring. Actually, if it is, then, then you have a problem and you should change. You should do something else, you know, um, but I think that the, the, the importance of actually having fun, you know, learning is fun. Uh, growing is fun. And uh, it's interesting. I'll, I'll tell you an anecdote. Uh, when I first brought my, um, my son to school, um, you know, he went to school. Uh, and after, I think, his first week or so on, you know, he, he didn't really want to go to school. He was like, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And so uh, the next week on Monday, when I brought him to school and I, you know, we talked to the teacher and she's like, so how, how is no one doing? And I'm like, you know, he doesn't really like school. And I think in Europe or in Switzerland, uh, uh, you know, you go to the teacher and you say, my, my kid doesn't like school. They're like, yeah, so what? Like everyone else, you know, whereas in the US, the teacher said, oh my God, he doesn't like school. We need to find him a friend. We're going to make sure. And she spent the next three weeks making sure that he had at least one friend in school, that he was having the best time of his life. And he had a reason to come to school because once you get into a positive environment, the rest comes easy. You know, we, no one likes doing something that isn't, uh, that endures pain, right? If you don't have a positive reinforcement, why force yourself? Right. And so that positive reinforcement that's always there that can sometimes feel, you know, 
a little uh, over the top uh, as a European when you come to the US is actually a very powerful mechanism uh, to push you to go beyond, above and beyond what you can do. And it starts from a very young age. Great, thank you so much, Vincent, for all these insights. Um, maybe we can take one last question before we hop into the break. Um, I see, for instance, Edward has asked a question, what would you recommend if a student was working hard on a project, I, I assume it'd be a startup project or something, but who also has class to succeed in as well? Um, what would you recommend a student like that? You know, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one. I would say, you know, you, you got to do what you think is right. Uh, and you're the only one that can decide what's right for you. Um, I'm not here to, to be able to guide you one, one way or another. Um, the, you know, I'm, uh, I'm someone that's always followed my instincts. And, and I think we have a tendency of actually losing that. Uh, you know, the rational side of our brain uh, too often takes over. So, you know, follow your gut feeling. It's actually the, the gut is probably the, the, the thing that is able to absorb, not just what you, you're able to comprehend uh, in your brain, but all of the other things. So when it feels right, it feels right. Great. Yeah, I think that's amazing advice. Thank you very much. Um, Yannick, I don't know if you had a question. I do have a question but um, it's more of an observation, first and foremost. Can we move the camera a little bit towards yeah. Yannick? <laughs> Thank you. That is perfect. Hi, everyone. So my name is Yannick, and I work uh, here at SwissNix as well. And I just have one brief observation. You know, I think one of the key soft skills uh, that is also very much part of the culture of Silicon Valley is the ability to reinvent yourself. And reinventing yourself is not something that we are very often taught very well to do in Switzerland. So I'm wondering in your experience, Vincent, you know, how did you reinvent yourself in, in so many ways? And, and what are some of the key lessons learned that we could be inspired with? Yeah, uh, I think that's a, it's a great observation and, and a great question. You know, I have uh, many friends who planned their careers from the moment they started studying and they knew exactly what they were gonna do, how they were gonna get there, and they had every step figured out. Um, and I never had that. And for a long time, it actually worried me. And, and, you know, cause people ask you the question, so what's next? How, what are you, how, what's your career about and, and how are you planning? Um, and you know, the, the short answer is, I think you gotta, you gotta follow your passion. And for me, that's always been my guiding principle, whatever I did. I do two, 300%. I put everything I have I, and, and, and I go all the way. But, you know, sometimes things change, the environment changes and, and you, you reorient your passion. Um, and so for me, that's always been my, uh, you know, if I look at my journey, actually, if anyone was to pick up my CV, you, you probably wonder why I did all of the things that I did. Uh, and the reason is uh, just pure out of passion. You know, I started as a, doing signal processing and audio engineering for Dolby. And then I moved to Nestle, you know, why would I go to Nestle and work on soups and bouillon and ice cream and all of that stuff, you know, like coming from technology. And the reality is I got really curious in understanding how you, how such a big company operates. How do you drive a strategy of a company that's 300,000 people that operates in countries like Africa, as well as in the US or Switzerland? Um, and it became a passion. I wanted to understand it. I wanted to figure it out. And so I joined Nestle. And then after that, I really realized that I was missing the thing that I personally really am driven by, which was technology and making things. Uh, and so I went back and I, uh, I created a, a startup. Um, and then I did that for five years. Um, and after my startup, um, you know, I got to a point where there was a crossroad uh, and um, I wanted to get back to physical devices. So I did software for five years uh, and I thought that the world was shifting and that it wasn't just about software. It was going to be about those connected devices. Uh, and I um, and that's why I made the move that I made. Um, so 
if you ask me what I'm going to be doing in five years, it's going to be hard uh, to tell you because I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, if you follow your passion, you, you'll see, you, you can figure it out. It's going to come your way. But whatever I did, I always did it, you know, 300%. So I, I commit everything I have. Uh, and, and it's not an effort. You know, I do it just because I love what I do. I love it. I love it. Thank think you so this, much. Yeah, I think this is all great advice. Um, and I think this wraps this part of the lecture up perfectly. We will head into a break now. Vincent, thank you so much for, for your time, for providing us with all this information and inspiration. Um, we'll be back at 7.15 on your end um, with Selim and Sven. Please, during the break, you can turn your cameras off, um, your microphones off, and please be back on time at 7.15. And stay in the room. Please stay in the room. Yes, applause. <laughs> and stay in the Zoom link, please. Don't get out of the Zoom link. Just stay in there. But go and get some fresh air. I'll see you in 15. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone, we are back. I hope you all enjoyed your breaks. I'll give it a few more seconds for everybody to settle back in. Again, please have your audio as well as your microphones turned off so we don't get any noise going on. Perfect. Almost everybody here. Great. Okay, I think we'll just start. Um, Selim and Sven both joined the call during the break, so welcome to the both of you. We're glad to, to have both of you here. <laughs> Hi, you too. And we're going to start with Selim. Um, hi, Selim. You want to say hello? Hello, hello. Hello. Um, quick introduction for all of you. So Selim co-founded the company Rosy Reality, which was an ETH spin-off that's focused on developing augmented reality uh, technology for the entertainment industry. And after multiple funding rounds and acquisition by a big Bay Area company um, last year, actually, Selim established the Kick Fund, which is a $65 million fund to invest in Swiss innovation at the seed stage. And I asked Selim to tell you all his story on, the, on what innovation means in the San Francisco Bay Area and on how that possibly even caused him to pivot his product um, due to the external conditions out here in the US market. Selim, thank you for being here and the floor is yours. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction and thanks for having me. Um, I think to, I just gonna set a little context before I'm gonna jump uh, into the SF Bay Area um, so as it was said, I co-founded Rosie, um, late 2016 at ETH and, um, we came out of a, let's say Google laboratory, um, that was based at ETH. Um, and we were working on what was called mapping systems. So we were trying to understand the room using just one camera, let's say. Um, and back then that was sort of, sort of new what we were doing. And so the excitement around the project was pretty high. Um, and what we then did actually um, galvanized by a professor of ours who sort of told us, hey, you guys could turn this into a company rather than continue your PhD. Um, we started basically reaching out to a couple of investors in Switzerland first, where the excitement was not as high um, because it was actually a very sort of, um, technical product. There was a very experimental product, um, let's say beginning of 2017, nobody quite knew what it was um, and if AR is ever going to take off. And so then I reached out to some people in SF that I knew and um, there we were able to raise our first funding round rather quick, let's say. Um, it took us actually two weeks to raise a million dollars and this was actually because sort of, let's say the bubble in San Francisco started to understand much quicker what AR could be and what AR could become. So the excitement was, was way, way higher. And I think this could be um, maybe an interesting sort of first lesson actually for us. It was that we saw that in Zurich, we were technically very advanced against, let's say other geographies and even against the Bay Area. And so investors were actually keen to get to know founders from outside, especially founders working 
um, back then in vision technology and ETH um, had a very good uh, name. And so this actually helped personally me to raise the first round. Um, and then I think sort of the innovation started happening um, in San Francisco and not so much in Zurich anymore. We started to build our team in Zurich, yes, but um, through the investment coming from um, SF investors, the network sort of started coming from San Francisco, much, much, much more than it came from Switzerland. And this was the first time actually I founded a company. So I was totally new to this entire thing. And I started noticing that one of the most important things to build a company back then, or probably even today, is, is the network. Who do you have access to at what time? And basically, who can you show your product or who can you talk to to improve your product? How fast can you get access to customers? And all of this happened actually much easier in San Francisco than it happened in Switzerland. So sort of innovation for us happened through so-called reciprocity. So people were just happy giving back, right? And through this process of actually giving back, through this process of being happy to meet up for coffee, for instance, or being happy to introduce you to someone at Apple, at Facebook, at Google, um, we were able to show our technology to many, many customers very early on which then helped us to start positioning our product in a way that just made sense for the market. And I think this is one of the big differences to, let's say, many startups in Switzerland, much like ours who come out of the university, um, is just sort of the connection with the customer very early on. Because now in my capacity, let's say, as investor, what I often see is that many founders never go actually talk to the customers. They just sit in their laboratory or in their offices in front of their um, MacBooks, probably like we do right now, all of us, and actually never go talk to one single customer because they believe they understand the product, they understand the market because they're so smart. And, you know, so why should they go speak to anyone outside of their bubble? And I think when you work in a geography such as SF, or it could also be London or Berlin, um, very quickly you understand that you got to talk to the customer early on to actually shape your product. And just to be clear, it doesn't mean that the customer will tell you what to build because they actually don't know, but at least you get to understand what's important to them, how they might be using what you're doing, and then it's, it's still your job as, as a product person or as a startup to sort of take these insights and turn them into products. And so this is sort of the big change. This was a big change for us um, that we were forced to talk to customers early on. Then the change number two was just the velocity of capital. Um, because if, if you had something that worked or that was promising to work, Capital was abundant in, in uh, San Francisco, or let's just call it the Bay Area. And more interestingly is the more capital you raise, the more capital was available to you. Just because um, you have so many investors there that know each other, that sort of try to mark up their books, that they start sort of shopping you around to their friends. And so then if you sort of keep delivering on the potential that you showed during your previous funding round, raising money actually um, is just sort of part of, of the story that you're writing because everybody's incentivized that you raise more money. Maybe we could talk later about what this actually means in a broader ecosystem and now that, that I'm on the other side of the table. Um, you know, some call it the Ponzi scheme because you're sort of marking up your deals by sort of pushing you to, to their friends. Uh, if you want, we can talk about this later on, but it just, the positive thing is it gives people the ability to at least test out their ideas and, and be ambitious with, with ideas that might change in the future. Um, and this was the case for us in, in San Francisco. So we got to talk to the right customers early on. We got the capital at the right time. So capital injection was always given. We were able to hire a good team because we were able to talk to the customer and because we had the capital, this attracted talent. 
And then talent attracted better product choices and better product choices, again, better customers. So you had this upward spiral that happened for us um, in sort of a condensed time frame. And um, it then all ended basically by us uh, having some global deals with very big companies. And then um, at the end, one of these big companies uh, decided to actually, um, let's say, acquire all of the assets and, and parts of the team because it was just for them financially more interesting than just to keep us paying royalties and fees, basically. Um, and yeah, I think that's sort of how we from, from Switzerland adapted to the fast paced mindset in San Francisco, to the availability of capital, to the access to customers, and how we then sort of started moving towards um, getting acquired by one of our early partners. And now sort of taking a step back and being in, in the position as an investor, what I actually really like doing is to invest early in, in technical talent here in Switzerland, but then sort of wake them up to the reality that they need to go talk to customers early, early on and be smart about it. And then also be ambitious enough to, much like Sven or, or, or I, you know, be ambitious enough to go to SF and raise money also from the famous guys. Because again, Swiss people, especially from ETH or EPFL, are worldwide leading when it comes to you know, technology, specific technology areas such as vision, robotics, um, you know, autonomous, autonomous vehicles and all of that stuff. We're worldwide leading, um, but we're unfortunately not behaving that way often. Um, so I hope that you know, more people such as Sven and I or other founders who went to SF sort of stay in the ecosystem in Switzerland and start sort of waking up our, our peers, our friends, and tell them, look, go out to Berlin, go to London, go to SF, go get that money, go get those customers, um, because you can do it. And Thank you. Uh, I see the story. Thank you so much, Salim. Thank you so much for giving us insights into your transition from Switzerland to the US and for highlighting also the importance of getting to know your customers and really taking that seriously and figuring out how to pivot your product um, accordingly. And it's also interesting to hear how you perceived the Bay Area to be a place that where the accessibility is given to influential people, to, to investors. I'm sure that you and Sven will have a great exchange about that experience as well later on in the discussion. Thank you so much, Salim. Oh, and you. I'll move right over to Sven before we jump into the moderated discussion. Um, Sven Brunner, we have you with us. Hello, Sven. Hello, everyone. Um, Sven is the founder and CEO of HoloOne. And HoloOne is a software company developing Sphere, which is an award-winning standardized mixed reality platform solution. And Sphere offers out-of-the-box functionality for major enterprise use cases to tackle challenges across various verticals in a single unified solution. And yes, I had to read that because it's very complex. Thank you, Sven, for being here. Um, I asked you to tell your story on the mindset shift that was required on your end to, to receive funding out here in San Francisco Bay Area. So thank you for being here and I'm happy to hand it over to you for the next few minutes. Thank you very much, Julia. Hello, everyone. Thanks, to, thanks for having me uh, this uh, evening, for most of you. Um, I can actually cut it short and just uh, tell you that everything that Selim said is, is absolutely true. Um, <laughs> but uh, maybe I can point out. My phone is like very off and there's a lot of sound coming in. We can't hear you right now. There was like a lot of very disturbing noise. <laughs> Maybe without the headset. I don't know. <laughs> hello, hello. Oh, perfect. Yeah, okay. now we have clear sound. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> now I have my old, my old uh, gaming headset. I hope that well, uh, doesn't disturb anyone. It's, um, it's today's topic, so it's perfect. Okay, okay. Um, no, I was just going to say, uh, maybe I, I first quickly, um, very quickly, one or two minutes, explain what we're actually doing. Because, uh, as you said, it's, it's uh, maybe for people who are not familiar. Actually, I can also maybe show a quick slide um, that uh, you have a little bit of better idea of, of uh, what it is that we're doing. Um, 
So as uh, as Yulia uh, said, our product is a, a mixed reality enterprise platform. Um, and it's basically, let me move that up a little bit. Um, and it's basically kind of unifies all the, the, the high value enterprise mixed reality or augmented reality use cases. So we're compared to, to um, what Selim and team was doing. It's less deep tech, I would say. It's more like application focused. So these are all, uh, you can almost think of them as, as applications, as apps that you can install on these like augmented or mixed reality headsets. And these are kind of the, the large use cases we currently see in, in the market. So things like workflow guidance, guiding users through very complex procedures. So basically you have the headset on and the headset basically, and our software tells you what to do for, for each step. Um, remote assistance, basically the ability to connect people on site with experts anywhere in the world. And then basically they see through the eyes of the person on site and can work together with them to um, solve issues and problems. Um, one of my personal favorites, the digital workspace, uh, it's really designed to have several people both in the same physical space, but also uh, in remote locations that it can work together in a in an augmented or mixed reality space. So you can really imagine you can share 3D models, holograms, place them into your room, and everything is shared in real time. So similar to what we're doing now, uh, but it would be a 3D space, all the content we share, you can place around in your field of view. Uh, people that are uh, not in your same physical location are visualized as avatars. We have an avatar chat. You can talk to them. Um, so very futuristic things. Also what we see as the, the next iteration of a, of a meeting or of a conferencing tool. Um, and also things like life-size overlays. So that we have customers, they go on the construction site, overlay 3D models with what has already been built and are able to compare that and for installation checks and so on. And this is basically all the, the use cases we have bundled basically in, in our software. And uh, we also have like customers from, from all around the world, um, some very prominently from Switzerland, like Lint. Uh, we also get uh, chocolate every year as a, as a present from our customer, um, but also like international customers like Micron, a semiconductor company here in the US, Renault, the, the French car manufacturer. So that's basically where, where uh, the company is and what we're doing um, as, a, as a product. And um, Maybe what is a bit different or, or what our journey was, we raised actually our seed round in, in Switzerland still. Um, and as Selim said, the excitement was relatively low initially. It was a um, kind of a high risk um, play uh, for us as well. That back it was a bit later. We were in 2018, um, but still it was not, not a big thing in Switzerland. Uh, it also felt like tech investors in Switzerland are not... They didn't want to see what we what we uh, basically wanted to sell them, right? It was a, a high risk play. We were going after the, the very big, large market, um, and a lot of them were, were not super excited. So it, it took us a while to raise our seed round in Switzerland. Um, I didn't uh, at that point we didn't make the jump yet to the US, so we, we stayed in Switzerland for for that. Uh, we still succeed. I think it was a, an okayish uh, seed round for for uh, Switzerland. We also raised more than a million in Switzerland. Um, but it took us a while, but then it became very, very clear, um, very quickly that, that we can't stay in Switzerland forever. Right. It's, um, it's first of all, a very small market. Um, as Selim said, the, the, we, we almost saw also the potential reach in terms of funding, um, that we, we didn't believe that we could raise a lot of more money in Switzerland, given the, the circumstances for exactly the same reasons, right. It's, it's a bit, um, the risk aversion is definitely a, a big thing in Switzerland. Uh, a lot of investors are uh, kind of risk averse or they, 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 they just think sometimes a little bit smaller, right? Um, and this is also maybe the kind of then the, the big shift, or this is, first of all, what's the reason why I then went into the US um, to, to fundraise, but also to um, kind of develop the business, right? The US is for our industry expected to be the biggest or is already the biggest market, uh, but also will be in the, in the next few years. Um, and that was kind of a logical step then for us. And um, the, the mindset shift that, that you talked about, Julia, is, is definitely something that, uh, or I, in my opinion, have to quickly adapt. It's, um, for me, it's a very, very welcoming um, climate here in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I never felt like that. Uh, there were actually, everyone encourages you to, even as a, as a foreigner uh, or, or someone who's not from here, to kind of engage with everyone. Everyone is more than happy to help, to connect exactly what, what Selim said, right? There's a very open culture here to kind of push innovation, but you also need to kind of sell yourself a little bit differently, or at least in my opinion. So in, in Switzerland, what, what I 
and I still do that when I talk to to customers or, or investors in Switzerland. You have to be kind of a little bit modest, humble. Um, you you got to be careful too, because if you it it for Swiss for Swiss people or investors, it it sometimes it sounds like bragging uh, or or being arrogant if you if you kind of push a bit too much. And this is definitely not something they want to see. And sometimes in the in the U.S., when you talk to investors, you definitely have to be you have to be confident. You have to really show them that you believe in, in your product and your mission. Um, you also have to show them that you can think big, um, that that you have high and ambitious goals. Um, and this is, I think, is, is definitely a bit of a, of a kind of mind shift. Or I, I think originally or growing up, I was rather also a shy person. Uh, I was not too outgoing. Um, so for me, that was kind of a, also a bit of a learning curve, right? That you have to... Um, be bold, also appear bold, um, and and you know, really kind of sell yourself well. I think this is this is uh, it's a, sometimes also a bit of cliche, right? That's something we probably all all heard already. Um, but it is definitely definitely the, the case, as at least uh, in in my experience, that uh, coming from Switzerland uh, or Europe in in um, to the U.S. that this is this is something you kind of have to adapt a little bit. You have to. Um, sell yourself differently or kind of more aggressively, so to say, than uh, maybe what you would do in, in Switzerland. So that's maybe kind of the, the, the biggest difference in terms of kind of mind, mind shift or, or how you have to sell yourself. Uh, but again, it's a great area to be in. It's, it's also, um, you, you, everything moves so much faster. That's, I think that's what I enjoy the most. Um, in Switzerland, I always had the feeling everything goes a bit slowly. It, it, everything takes a lot of time. Everyone is like, wait and see. Uh, and this is very different here. This is really like people are, are ready to move, especially if they're excited about what you're doing. Um, everyone is in so such a close proximity. Everyone connects you to the next person and the next person. And, um, and I can't, I think what Selim said, I can't overstate how important the, the, the network is. Um, and this also took me a while to develop. I came here with no connections whatsoever. I'm not sure if that was the, maybe the case for Selim as well, that uh, I didn't have any, um, but we can maybe talk about that later. For me, it was like, really, I came here knowing nobody. Um, and it took me a while to kind of establish that network. But once you get into that, and once you, you have it, it, everything gets so much easier, right? And, and the same, as Selim said, with investors, right? It's uh, also for a funding round, we're just raising our series A round now. So we're not, um, we're still, I'm still, I'm not uh, on the other side of the table yet. I'm still, still on the, in the founder seat. Um, and once also there, once you have like the lead investor who believes in you, it, the rest is then very, very quick and very, very easy. You just kind of need to, then also at this point, you need to convince someone who really, really strongly believes in you. Um, and then with their network, with, with, uh, because they also have this interest in to push you and to, um, you know, get other people excited. That's a really, really important, really critical. Thank you both so much for all these fantastic insights and for being so open and honest about everything as well. I think there were a lot of major points that were mentioned here about the Swiss mindset of kind of trying to think small and do not oversell yourself um, and, where you really had to have that mind mindset shift when you when you came out here. So we are all curious to hear more, and I I at least have a lot of questions for you guys. Um, before we jump into the moderated discussion, um, I want to know from our students, and I'm sure this is also interesting for Sven and Selim to see what is your relationship with startups. Um, we have a poll ready for you guys. Are you just generally interested in entrepreneurship? Do you already have a business idea? Have you already started working on a specific product or a service? Um, are you working for a startup or even running one? Or are you not very interested into startups or entrepreneurship? Um, again, this is an, an anonymous poll, so don't shy away from whatever answer. <laughs> uh, we're just curious to see where you're at. Okay, so from what I can see so far is most of you are generally just interested in startups, or entrepreneurship. Um, some of you have a business idea or even started working on a project, a project product, which is great to see. We have one person who's not really interested in entrepreneurship, which is totally fine as well. Um, one person already working in or running a startup even. Wonderful. Yeah, this is great to, to see and interesting to, to know you all a little bit better. 
Um, yeah, I think to, to break the ice, I'm just going to jump in with my first question. And um, I guess I'm going to ask Sven this. You mentioned already a lot about your reasons why you wanted to come to the Bay Area, the potential you saw in it, you, um, the risk aversion, and the possibilities for investments and so on. I would like to hear a little bit more about what were maybe also some of the cons? What were you contemplating? What was your thought process? Because I'm sure it was not just all positive thoughts about coming out here. Could you guide us through the pros and cons a little bit? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me, I mean, honestly, mostly of the cons had not much to do with the with the business itself. Um, it was uh, it was mostly personal reasons. Uh, because of course, I've I've grown up in Switzerland. I've spent the first 28 years of my life in Switzerland, and you have a, a you have a big fan or you have a family you have friends and this was actually the hardest the hardest part right kind of the making this decision to kind of leave that leave that all behind and kind of you know jump into a totally new adventure and move going to a different country that's um pretty far away right it's nine hours time difference right it's not always easy to communicate with with um people back home um and i think that was that was a little bit or that's was the only thing that kind of made me um maybe not really hesitate a bit but that was definitely on the con side but let's say on the pro side there were um it was just overwhelmingly clear that that you know for as a next step for the company we had to do this um and this wasn't obvious for everyone right i i a lot of also my my other my employees that were in switzerland they were like why are you doing this now we just had a funding round in switzerland and that's also kind of important right as a especially as a founder right you need to think ahead right it's it's not um it doesn't it's not enough to kind of um you know live in the moment only of course it's also important you need to to manage uh, what, what you're doing now but it's, it's very important also to plan ahead and um from a from a business perspective it was just was so clear right if we want to really really grow um if we if we want um more, more money then also to grow and and proper funding um, we almost had to to go into the U.S., especially also then to enter the market and all those things. Um, so for me, were, the pros were all like company and business related. The cons were actually mostly family, friends related, so very personal reasons, uh, and not so much about the the company itself. Even. Okay. Okay. Great. How was that for you, Celine? What were some of the the cons for you when you were contemplating about coming to the U.S. with Rosie Reality back in the days? Um, I think the cons were more based on, on talent because basically at, you know, in 2016, 2017, it was a very nice sort of arbitrage possibility that we were doing, um, because sort of the money that we raised lasted much longer in Switzerland than it would have last in, in San Francisco because talent is just so darn expensive because everybody and their grandmother is sort of starting a sort of startup. So everybody needs the same talent. Everybody needs the engineers. Um, so it's a very strong employee market instead of employer market. Um, so you're sort of at a disadvantage if you're not working on the most, let's say, um, exciting technology. Uh, thank God AR at the time was sort of the hot thing because Apple was talking about it and Facebook was talking about it. So attracting talent worked, but um, we're clearly overpaid um, when compared to Zurich. So this was maybe one one of the cons, but okay. that sort of con probably got offset by just the additional benefit that you had by being on the ground um, in SF. That's an interesting insight. And maybe I can then kind of segue over to the question that was being asked in the chat with that. We have somebody who has a tech startup, a tech project, general question, should I go to Silicon Valley? Um. So you want to go? <laughs> I mean, it's always hard to it's hard to generalize, right? It it really depends on the the, the product and what it is exactly. Um, if I had to, you know, just guess based on the, the very little information, it it probably doesn't hurt. Um, it's it's uh, it it. I mean, it depends what you want to do in San Francisco, right? I I also we, we do that as well. Like the engineering, for example, is still in Switzerland for us as well. Uh, as Selim said, the, the salaries here are crazy exp or crazy high. Um, so I think what, what our plan is or, or how we approach is we, we, you or do in the San Francisco Bay Area or here in the U.S. what needs to be done in the U.S., right? Um, if, if you, that's also why I'm here personally. Most of the team is still back in Switzerland because 
um, connecting with investors and doing business development, all those things. For that, it's 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 very very useful, right? If you wanna, if you have a big idea and you wanna wanna go big, then then I would say yes, absolutely. Um, but it's not necessarily also the best idea to always just shift everything here. Um, it for, for us this hybrid model of having some things in in Europe and Switzerland um, and some things doing here in, in in the U.S. or San Francisco Bay Area that kind of proved to be very um, or working pretty well. Yeah, I mean, I would add to that that, I mean, if your product demands sort of global distribution from day one, probably San Francisco is, is a very, very good place to be. Um, but if you believe that your product sort of can survive within, for instance, the Dach region, you don't need to be in, in SF. You know, it, it depends, as Sven said, on your, on your own ambition. If, if you believe you're working on a product that needs to go global quickly, then definitely move probably out of Switzerland um, just because the Swiss market is so small and, and you want to be close to the customer again. Um, and there, you know, Berlin, London, Tel Aviv, San Francisco can all be good, good places. Yeah. So just think about what your product demands. Right? We have another student that's asking you, Salim, whether you still have the same motivation for your product than, that you did have before after it was acquired by a company. How does that look like for you? If I still have the same motivation, probably passion for, for my product. Um, so yeah, I mean, let me tell you whoever, whoever asked this. Um, thanks for the question first. And uh, second, so I worked at this company um, who acquired us uh, for about six months, roughly. And then I left. And that's just because sort of that's the founder in me, sort of I, I couldn't take the politics, even though it's a very, very nice company. Um, but hey, every time I see someone using my product or every time sort of I know it gets used in, in a product, then I'm pretty proud of it. Um, but other than that, I mean, hey, yeah, every, every time I sort of know that people are using it, um, definitely you, you, you can bet like if if somebody uses your product that you've built it's the best feeling ever right that's so rewarding so yes very very passionate about my product still beautiful words thank you for that answer um i have a question for you sven um us at swiss next in san francisco we're with we're witnessing a shift towards more impact-based decision-making. And our organization too, we have shifted our actions um, and our focus towards being more focused on the impact that we are creating with the work that we're doing here. Um, my question to you is, how have you perceived the focus of US investors on your company being guided by a particular overarching impact. May that be an impact for ecology um, or for society? How did you perceive that? Um, so honestly, and, and I think this has a lot to do with, with the product we're, we're developing um, because we're, we're clearly, um, we we're business, we're business uh, or a B2B startup, right? Or a B2B company. And honestly, I think that almost never came up so far um, that investors here, at least the ones I've talked to, um, maybe they have some, some nice words on their website or something else. But when, when you talk to them, most importantly is, is there a financial opportunity, right? Is there a financial return? Um, I think that still supersedes everything else, um, which, which I mean, is kind of understandable, right? These, these VCs are there to, to make money. We are a company, we're there to make money. Um, we have to, a little bit sometimes that we get like a thumbs up because we're, you know, the, the whole remote collaboration obviously also helps to, um, work together more efficiently when you're not in the same place and you can um, omit some travel and things like that. But this is definitely not the, the main driver. So if someone looks at our company, um, and, and again, this is very, very different. If I think if you're clearly in the, in the, let's say a developing a technology that has a very, very direct impact on, um, social issues or, or climate or fighting climate change or something like that, which we're maybe doing indirectly, but definitely not like heads on um, that might change. Right. And maybe there's there, I also know there are VCs and institutions that specifically fund companies like that, but for us being a very mostly like uh, a B2B play that, that needs to make money also, this is also the metric that most investors look at or are interested at. Um, so if, if it came up, it's, it's, 
yeah, it's like not even in the top 10 maybe of priorities of, of the investors, right? Okay. Um, not saying that this is a good thing necessarily, right? I, I, I would also agree that we should, everyone, uh, whatever we're doing, we should have that always in the back of our heads, right? Um, but at least in my experience in the last few years, it, it's not a, a very high priority for most VCs. At least. Okay, okay. Um, Selim, how does the question of impact affect your investment decisions at KickFund? Is that a priority of yours at all? Um, could we quickly define impact? It can be ecological impact, it can be social impact, an overarching impact that a startup tries to achieve in society. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I'm, but yeah, uh, Im impact is is a huge heuristic, basically, when, when I take my decisions. Um, because at the end of the day, it's it's you're investing money and it feels like impact is a very good proxy for a generating a return, right? That, it feels like if we define impact that broadly, um, impact would mean a bigger footprint in the market, would mean a bigger revenue number, would mean you know a bigger company overall. So obviously as an investor now, not as a founder, I'm, I'm hugely interested in investing in impactful startups. Um, the way you know you could define impact, as you said, um, when it comes to um, green impact or or social, um, then to be honest, there um, I'm really interested in the green economy, you know, because I feel like we have to, right? It, it feels kind of silly that um, not everyone is trying to sort of make the world a greener place, because at the end of the day. Um, yeah, otherwise the planet doesn't exist anymore. So obviously um, I'm putting my dollars to use as well for, for um, a green impact. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it generally actually, luckily it correlates with higher returns for my fund. Good to hear. Yeah, that's good to hear. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, I also want to be aware of time because we know that Selim will actually have to jump off at 11 o'clock or what is that, eight o'clock for you all um, on the dot. So I wanted to open up the opportunity for all of you to ask Selim some more questions if you have any. Um, I see there is a question in the chat for Sven that we're going to touch upon in a little bit. Is there anything you would like to know from Selim? Yannick, who's right next to me, he has, he has a question, I see. <laughs> so um, for everybody else, feel free to type your questions into the chat. Hi, Selim, Yannick here uh, with Swiss Next. I really enjoyed everything you said here about the impact of the green economy. And one question I will have is, is whenever you engage with uh, funders, you know, people that are investing in your company, or whenever you are after fundraising, where do you make choices, you know, between receiving some funding and money from those investors and remaining faithful to your values and to the principles that you want to keep as being at the core of your company? And is there a tension sometimes between what the investors may want to, uh, to see a company achieving and your own value, both as a founder or both as a company? And how do you, at the end of the day, remain faithful to your idea of impact and your idea of uh, social impact? So you're asking me now as a founder or as an investor, that question? As a founder, yeah. Uh, but if you, if you also have some examples uh, as an investor, I think those two perspectives might be very interesting. Mm -hmm. so, so the way I understood this question was more like, what if incentives are not aligned between the investor and, and basically the founder of, of the startup? Exactly. Yeah, um, I mean, that's a good question. And it tends to happen so I saw it more happening in, let's say, second and third tier markets, so founder investor markets, um, because in, let's say, a first tier market such as SF, um, very often the investor understands that the founder is their customer, let's say, uh, meaning they have to support the founder. Um, and especially, I think you got to look at this question in in different stages. Um, because if, if you look at the pre-seed and seed stage, and just quickly to set the scene when, you know, for, for someone who's not sort of in this weird bubble that is startups, um, um, funding startups is based on stages. So the very, very early stage is called pre-seed, then the next stage is sort of seed, and then you have the bigger round, series A, series B, series C. And every time 
there's more and more and more money. So that's just nomenclature. So that question basically depends on the stage because if if you get pre-seed and seed stage funding as a founder, um, the investor knows very well that it's a bet on talent and not so much a bet on product, let's say. So um, a, a good investor will support that talent um, the best he can. And if that means sort of helping him sort of change idea or change product or change market or change team, that investor will actually do that. Um, and, you know, this was personally the case for us. Um, they sort of gave us money for a product that we didn't end up building, but it was all fine. They still, you know, told us, like, just go after the opportunity in the market. Um, and that was a very good relationship. But then obviously, you know, to be fair to also investors, they start becoming more demanding after, you know, a series A or series B. Let's say the, the startup is five, six, five years old. You sort of raise a big series B in today's market, like 50, 60, 70 million dollars. Then obviously, um, you know, the probably the investor will not be as easy anymore on, on just changing everything. Just because at the end of the day, investors do have their own investors as well. So they do have fiduciary, fiduciary uh, responsibilities against their own money uh, givers. So um, sometimes then you got to be more stringent. But I think just to keep it more, um, let's say, towards what we would be dealing with right now, I think a very good investor incentives are aligned in such a way that they um, empower the founder to do what he needs to do to basically start selling a product in the market. So interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Selim. I don't see any questions coming from the audience for you so far. So I will take these last five <laughs> minutes to ask you one of mine. <laughs> um, and my question is more so of a foresight one. Um, we've seen the gaming industry shifting from being more about fun and entertainment towards now the gaming industry really being used in, in healthcare, in fintech, in um, education. And my question to you is, how has the US paved your perception on how you see the gaming industry influencing or even being a role model for other industries in the future, let's say in the next five, 10 years? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question, actually. Um, and it sort of brings me back to a lot of um, meetings that we had at, at Rosie, where we sort of had the mantra, um, there is this famous saying from Andreessen, sort of software is eating the world, right? Um, and what we had written on the walls, literally painted on the walls, is that gaming is eating the world. Because as you just said, a lot of experiences, probably every experience out there is gamified today. I mean, from, from the fintech products that make you sort of spawn confetti when you buy something to a healthcare product that gives you points when you start moving or just boring, simple tax fix, taxation products that make you feel good when you fill out your taxes, right? So basically, I truly believe gaming is eating the world in the sense that every experience that customers are going to like to do is gonna be gamified. And the simple reason is that we're still all just humans driven by dopamine, which is sort of, you know, in our brain and makes us move. So it's actually just natural that once you gain the ability to gamify stuff, you're going to do it just because you see that it's driving engagement, it is driving sort of, um, you know, time spent in an application. Um, and that just goes back to the biology of, of, of the user, of us. Right. Um, and I think it makes sense because if, if stuff is more delightful to use, it's a win win. You know, we're going to enjoy it and the company is going to enjoy the time spent and the engagement. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, we're going to see this trend actually accelerate, um, be it also in Web 3.0 or whatever we're going to call it for sure. Um, and I'm actually happy about it. Yeah. Good. I think this rounds this up perfectly. Um, thank you so much, Salim, for oh, being here, you. for taking the time. Um, thank you to all of the, the students who also asked their questions as well. Um, Salim, have a great day. Um, and we'll, the rest of us will stay here together with Sven. We'll have another 30 minutes to ask a lot of questions. Bye, bye Salim. <laughs> bye, thank guys. you. Thank you bye. very much. Thanks. Great. So, my, hello. Uh, may I start a question for uh, 
second this round. Can, of course. I, can I? You want to ask oh. a question? Of course, go ahead. So, yeah, uh, we were discussing a lot uh, about the uh, mindset of uh, founders who go to San Francisco. Uh, I would like to ask the question to, well, actually, I wonder also to ask it, ask it to, to Selim, uh, but now it's only uh, remained. How do you compare uh, Swiss investor to uh, American in investors? So, uh, they are investors, especially from uh, at the pre-seed and seed uh, stages, because we all know that uh, afterwards, when uh, it's Series A and et cetera, things get very similar. But uh, how about business angels and uh, yeah, uh, that that stage? How do you compare the Swiss investors' mindset with the uh, San Francisco Bay Area uh, investor mindset? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's as like, uh, Selim, you already kind of said a little bit, it's, it's definitely for me, the biggest difference is, um, how, how people look at risk, um, risk reward, right? I mean, these are, these are the two things when you, as an investor, these are, I mean, I'm not an investor, but from on the other side, this, this is what investor want to see, right? There's a rate, obviously with every startup investment, that's why it's called venture capital. Um, it's risk is attached, right? But obviously there needs to be a reward, right? And what I think that the biggest difference is that in Switzerland, people are fine if the reward is a bit, the potential future reward is a bit lower, right? If you, they're completely fine if you're never ever going to be a billion dollar company, right? This is sometimes even pretentious if you, if you tell Swiss investors you want to be a billion dollar company, that's like, ooh, that's, they, they almost don't want to hear that, right? What they want to hear is, okay, I haven't identified this niche I'm really going after this niche. There's low competition in this, re in this niche. Um, maybe the reward will never, ever be very, very high, but the risk is also a bit lower, right? That's, that's, that's kind of the, I would say that, that if I would want to raise money in Switzerland, mostly that's how I would position my product or the other way around. If that's my product, I would probably go after Swiss investors, right? On the other hand, if you have a product that is riskier, um, potentially also higher reward, right? If it's if it has the potential to get a to a billion dollar company or even more, but obviously er everything that has the potential to go to a billion dollar company is risky. Um, it might also be more competitive, right? Maybe it's in a market that a lot of other players also want to go after. Um, that's very very hard to get money for in Switzerland because they they're all or. I mean, I'm generalizing here a little bit, of course. Um, there's, you will definitely find someone who doesn't think like that. But on average, um, most of them think a little bit smaller, right? There's like, they're not so comfortable with, with taking too, many, too much risk. Um, they're also fine if it doesn't have to go that high. In the US, it's different, right? They, they're willing to take risks if they think the idea is good enough. Um, if they believe in you enough, uh, they're willing to take those risks. But the reward needs to be needs to be high, right? There needs to be you need and, and I've I've been asked that multiple times here in the US. Okay, how do you when I explain use case and what we're doing, they, they would ask me a lot, okay, how do you uh, turn this into billion dollar business? That's that's a, a question I get a lot here in the US. I've never ever been asked that in Switzerland, right? There it's in Switzerland, they would ask you, okay, when are you break even? Um, how long, you know, it's it's more like these risk offsetting uh, questions. Uh, in the U.S., it's more about okay, how high can you go, right? Not necessarily doesn't even matter how much money you need to get there. Um, so that I think that's kind of the biggest difference in in uh, mindset or when talking to Swiss or U.S. investors. Great, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> Great, thanks, Vincenzo, for the question that you asked. Um, I think I will take the question that was asked in the chat for you, Sven, which is. Will the metaverse impact the way you develop your product? And if so, how? Um, yeah, it's a good question. It's a, there's a lot of buzz around, around the metaverse, especially now Facebook being even renamed themselves to, to meta. Um, so first of all, it's, it's a good thing for us, right? This is, this is at the moment mostly a buzzword, right? A, a big one. But this is, this is sometimes also how you, how you sell companies and products over, over buzzwords, right? Um, so for us, it's definitely good development that this is more in the mainstream again we saw a little bit of a um you know a lot of people believe that vr is the really next big thing a few years back and then it, it kind of didn't really go that mainstream yet and that kind of for a lot of people that was then like a bit uh 
Uh, they were a bit underwhelmed with what would happen. And now with the metaverse, it's it's getting hot again, right? The entire space is getting it's getting very hot again. And it's a huge, it's a very broad term, right? Um, I think for us, how how we see that or what the component that is actually interesting to me is more um I'm not a big fan of purely virtual worlds. Let's put it like that. This is also why we're doing augmented reality and not virtual reality mostly, uh, because the, the premise of the the purely the pure metaverse, maybe or the pure virtual world, is that um, also mostly you you everything is in virtual. You know, you almost es- like Ready Player One, right? You almost escape into a a virtual world. Um, and for me, it's much more appealing to kind of blend the physical and virtual world together, right? This is also. Uh, what we're doing and and uh, in that sense you can probably also call that a metaverse right that you uh, add add more and more things also persistently to the to the physical world um, but for us it's mostly this this um, kind of what what we're seeing kind of the future the future how we mostly collaborate together this is this is, I think where augmented or mixed reality can really really shine right the um, the way we what we're doing now is still very you know I'm staring into a screen on my on my computer um, if I had someone here next to me, that person would either kind of have to also stare into the screen here, and it would be very hard to, to communicate. And I think that with, with this new technology, to some extent also uh, virtual reality, but also augmented reality, offers a very natural evolution of, of how we can interact over large distances, right? This is, this is not going away. I think we, we all know that, that even after pandemic, it's, it's remote work will, will stay to some extent. And I think this is kind of the, 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 the next natural evolution to make remote work more efficient, that it, you know, it feels more natural. Um, so I think that's kind of the biggest influence. And again, let's see where the whole metaverse discussion is going. For, for us, that just basically means we're, we're immediately getting a little bit more valuable as a company because we're, because we're somewhat in that space. And th- that always helps. If you're in a space that is hot and that people, you know, there's a buzzword and people are excited about it, that, that always helps immediately. Great, great. Thank you so much, Sven. I have a question that goes kind of into what you just said. And also, by the way, to everybody else, um, the remaining time is up to you. And ask your questions. Um, we will do this lecture um, for as long as you have questions. If you don't have any anymore, we can also end the lecture. But um, Sven, one question I have for you. We talked so much about innovation and entrepreneurship and the mindset it requires. Um, You need to constantly find new opportunities, loopholes, new synergies, and so on. We're now sitting in this super virtual world, as you just mentioned, and um, we're constantly trying to find new ways of making it all more vivid. Um, Is augmented reality, is that kind of where you see it going? Is that how far it can get? Or where else do you see more opportunity, more synergies possibly in the future? Where do you see this going? You mean mostly the the, the, the collaboration or, or yes. remote communication? Or, exactly. Yeah, I think definitely, yeah. So in the, in the next five years, I think that's going to be the big shift away from um, purely like Zoom um, type meetings that you just share your screen and sit in front of a computer. Um, Because I guess most of you have never experienced it um, or or maybe some have already, I don't know. Uh, But working on it and and, um, having experienced these type of then remote meetings, it's it's really a game changer. You feel, um, it feels much more like people are actually with you in the same in the same space. So the whole avatar discussion is, is very very a big one there and very important, right? How do you visualize then those people in in your space and things like that? Um, but there's so many benefits to it. And I, I um, a lot of companies are actually betting on that. Um, also, look a lot of a lot of big ones, um, which makes it also interesting and also tough for us. But um, it's definitely going to for, for me for sure. In the next three to five years is going to be the new way. Uh, how we collaborate and and uh, especially on on the both rem- actually both remotely and in person. Um, beyond that, let, let's see let's see what happens. I think mostly the biggest change is also how the the technology evolves in terms of currently the the headset are still a little bit bulky. They get they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Right, that will be kind of the next uh, evolution. I, anyways, and a lot of people in my space see augmented reality as the next computing platform. Also after a smartphone, right, that will at one point. I initially kind of enhance the smartphone, but maybe then at one point replace. Um, and we see the same technological development, right? Things getting smaller, getting cheaper, getting more mainstream. 
uh, are more fun to use, but it's definitely a way more engaging way to, to work together, to, to have calls than, than what we're just doing now with, with uh, just on a, on a Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for these insights, thank you. Um, we have one more question from Jules. He asks, how much of an impact did the pandemic have on your company? Did it push you to prioritize communications, for instance, um, of AR, especially with companies like Shopify talking about moving to fully remote? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, for us, it, it sounds, and don't get me wrong, the pandemic was a horrible thing. I, I also wish it never happened, but for the business and the product we're doing, it, it did help actually. It, it, uh, it gave us a, a huge boost, um, especially everything around. And, and this, was, this was real projects, right? We had a, one of our largest customer now is a semiconductor company. And they really, after the pandemic hit, they, they had issues um, communicating, right? There were people in, they had the, their HQs are all in the US, but their factories are mostly in, in Asia and in Taiwan and Singapore uh, and China. And they could, barely keep operations up, right? And they then fast tracked um, like an AR project that we then won and we're now their suppliers. Uh, and there's many stories like that, right? A lot of people were forced in general to, to digitize their, their business processes, but especially around remote um, communication, remote collaboration that just really, really got a huge boost, right? And um, we definitely also kind of focused more on that, right? And in, in terms of where we developed the product and, and especially because it's not going away, right? It's not something that will just stay now during the pandemic, but so many people have realized um, that for certain things, it's just way more efficient, right? I'm, I'm still a big fan of in-person events and also in-person meetings, don't get me wrong, but for a lot of things, it's just much more efficient and, and easier. And definitely, we're, we're, this is going to be a, an enormous market, also an enormous opportunity. And this is definitely something we're, we're focusing on. Great. Thank you so much for that answer, Sven. If there are no more questions from the students, I have one last one from my side. What's next for Holo One? What are your next steps? So for us, we're actually very excited. I kind of, I think I've mentioned it very briefly. So we're uh, about to raise our Series A. Uh, as Selim said, it's kind of the first, sometimes the first really big venture round where you actually take venture capital and where the stakes are a little bit higher. As he said, um, seed and pre-seed, they mostly invest in, in you as a founder or, or the team or the idea. And at Series A, they they want to see some, some progress already, right? You need to have customers, you need to have revenue. Uh, it gets a little bit more serious. It's not enough to have a, a great idea. Um, and we're, we're about to close that in the next few weeks. Um, so the investors are all lined up. It's just more like a, a, legal, a legal thing now to, to get everything through. And then for us, 2022 is super exciting, right? That, that money will allow us to, to scale um, mostly also in people, we will roughly double the team. Um, we will kind of hire more people here in the US. We have more money to spend to, to work on a product, to, to you know, scale up marketing and sales. So this is, this is um, for me and the entire team, a very, very exciting time, right? To um, be able to, or have enough money and resources to really, to really scale up, go a bit bigger. Um, the stakes are also higher now. Pressure is higher, right? We, we need to deliver. It's not just that people give you money and then don't expect anything in return, right? They want to they, they wanna see something happening. Uh, but it's, it's very, very exciting, especially when we've talked about that, um, that we're in this space um, or in this industry that has so much potential, right? That's, that's still one of the, for me, at least one of the key future technologies in, in the industries. And this is extremely exciting to um, to be in and, and work with uh, also working with all these large companies. We have very large partners. Um, and uh, yeah, it's going to be a very exciting year for us uh, in 2022. Sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have my fingers crossed for you. Um, best <laughs> luck with everything. Um, I would like to hear from the students today um, just one key takeaway from, from the session of the entire lecture, just write it in the, in the chat. Let me know what one of your main takeaways is from today. I, I know there is many and also it's difficult to pick one. <laughs> um, also, Vincenzo, Cedric, feel free to, to type something in the chat. Sven, if there is something you've taken away from what Selim said or the exchange, feel free. Failure is progress, absolutely. Marilyn was inspired. Great to hear. 
growth mindset, growth mindset, growth mindset. Uh, yes, I, I think this I, is something. I cannot write it on the chat because uh, actually the, the screen is behind me. Oh, so course, I, don't, yes. I don't have access to uh, So I, I'm forced to talk, okay? <laughs> Uh, so, well, first of all, I would like to, to thank you, uh, you all for the organization. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, of course, the, uh, the speakers, uh, they are high, top level, very inspiring for, for me and I, I guess for our students. And um, yes, for me, the takeaway uh, is, is something that I knew for a little bit long time now uh, is the fact that, uh, yeah, uh, uh, we should move away from this classical Swiss mindset. At least, maybe it's not for everybody, okay? Because I cannot, uh, I cannot imagine turning a whole country uh, like Switzerland with very strong traditions, uh, sometimes conservative, uh, to a whole new mindset that is the one in, uh, from the United States. But uh, and the, at the same time, I think there are uh, smart people here in Switzerland that deserve to be sustained, supported, and uh, find also a, a kind of a, a small ecosystem here that will promote uh, this way of thinking. Uh, this, the risk taking, the fact that people are not um, uh, stressed by failure, that they want to try, try and try. And uh, I guess that we can recreate a, so, a sort of a micro uh, environment uh, 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 with, uh, with this American mindset also here in Switzerland, especially in uh, incubator accelerators and also our, uh, I mean, uh, our institution is, could be uh, the place where this uh, uh, dynamics can also happen. So I'm very, um, very proud and very happy that we can do this, uh, this trip and that uh, our students can experience that mindset in the United States. But I would also like that when they come back, uh, they could share also this experience to their fellow and hopefully some people will be more keen to start uh, a company with a vision, with a similar vision that uh, American founders have and not just to do things in a small scale and keeping it small just because investor uh, they don't want to take risk that's my hope and my effort to 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 kind of trigger that uh that interest to our students and uh, i'm really happy that swiss next support us and also the canton board that is uh, sponsoring this this program Thank you so much, Vincenzo, for your beautiful words. And um, I want to also say again, thank you for uh, to Sven for joining us today, for taking your time out of your busy schedule. I know you're very busy <laughs> with everything you're doing. So thanks a lot. Um, before I hand it over, maybe back to Cedric for some final words. One thing I would like to do with you all is take a picture with everybody. So maybe we can move well, our we can go, uh, to uh, on the other side of the we can also all be in front of their screens because we can move it into the gallery view. So we have the close up faces of everybody. If, if uh, anyone doesn't feel comfortable with it, feel free to turn your cameras off, but I would okay, well, love for everybody to, to be in there. Um, okay. <laughs> <Thanks> as well. <laughs> Next to the TV. <laughs> Smile everyone. <laughs> Thank you. you also try to turn the Perfect. screen. Oh, yeah. You want, no, this? Ah, that one. No, that's fine. No. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> and thank you all for all your engagement. I was really pleasantly surprised with all the questions that came along. So thank you so much. It was extremely interesting for me as well. And Cedric, if you want to add any closing words, um, please go ahead. <laughs> Well, um, a big thank you for having me as a visitor tonight. Um, I, I really enjoyed this session a lot. Uh, I like very much the mindset and the way that your questions and your impressions were about this mindset. Um, I hope you will come out of this class uh, having evolved in that way. As Vincenzo said, that's the purpose of it. Um, I, I will end this with sharing the, something that a previous professor from Berkeley had said coming here. Uh, he had visited a Swiss incubator at the ETH and 
the people there had told him very proudly that after five years, the startups they had sponsored, 70% um, of them were still alive. And the Swiss people had said this very proudly uh, so that they had invested in the right horses. And actually the teacher from Berkeley, what he said was, that's terrible. Do you imagine how many good ideas you let go? Because if you sponsored only the ones who were sure to work, that means that you left some pretty good talent behind. And so this was something which made my brain burst, but which is pretty normal, I guess, to Vincenzo and to Sven and to you and Swiss Next. And I hope that uh, you guys will come up with the same kind of bursting bubble in your brain that I had that day. So I wish you the very best for the end of this class and of course for the trip to San Francisco at the end. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. It was a wonderful session. Thank you. <laughs> All right, have, everybody have a good evening in Switzerland. Sven, have a good day in San Francisco and I'll see you all hopefully in February out here. Goodbye, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.